Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of my Karo Khan vs Everything speedrun. In this series I play two 10 minute games with zero increment. So it'll be game 1 followed by a short game analysis and then game 2 followed by a short game analysis. And it basically is what it says in the title. It's the Karo Khan vs Everything. No matter what my opponent plays as the black pieces I go c6 and d5. And no matter what my opponent plays as the white pieces, I go c3 and d4. Of course, not every position will be a typical Karo Khan. We'll get Slav defense type positions. We might even get some London looking positions, which I think might make me a heretic. But I will try my best not to go into pure Londons. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I got pretty good um, reception for the first episode. So thank you very much for that, guys. I hope you continue to enjoy the series. And let's get into game one. Timestamps will be below, 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 um, if you want to check those. All right, so we have the white pieces. I was actually about to play e4 because that's just muscle memory. That's what I play, but no, c3. Apparently, this is called the Saragossa opening, so okay. We're basically just going into a queen's pawn game. Knight c6 isn't a great move because... The knight isn't really targeting a whole lot because we control these squares very well. And to enforce that point even further, I'm going to play knight f3, which is obviously a natural developing move because I can't bring this knight out to c3. But the point is that we have really nice control over the dark squares in the center. So we're going to try and make this knight a bad knight. h6 seems to kind of be wasting time a bit. I suppose he might be thinking if I play bishop f4, something like g5 bishop g3 g4 but then i can put my knight on e5 maybe i just said i didn't want to get london positions but it actually might be <laughs> it actually might um okay no you know what we won't do that i think that's probably the principled way to play but it does also kind of give some purpose behind his h6 move to push g5 to attack my bishop so instead i'm not going to do that because also if he tries g5 g4 with my bishop on f4 and gets me to play knight e5 then he trades his bad knight off this pawn should be moved to c5 if you want to put a knight on c6 the knight shouldn't really be in front of the pawn in these queen pawn positions typically okay queen b3 is tempting just to eye up the d5 pawn and the b7 pawn h3 would wouldn't be a bad move i think i'm just going to throw that in there if he wants to trade then i'm happy i will get my bishop on this nice diagonal you could maybe take with the g pawn and put a rook on g1 but since none of my other pieces are really developed yet i don't love that idea e5 is certainly playable which is what my opponent goes for and if I take and knight takes, he's got a decent position. So I'm not going to take. And if he pushes e4, I will just drop my bishop back and we can play for c4. So I think preempting that queen to b3 is a good move. Because we're eyeing up d5, we're eyeing up b7, and we will be supporting a future c4 pawn push. Because one of the downsides of moving this pawn to e5 <clears throat> is that it can't support the d pawn. And remember, this c pawn can't move to support the d pawn because the knight's in the way. He could go knight a5, I suppose. But the knight, I don't know, looks a bit out of place. b6. Now, this obviously weakens this diagonal, but it's difficult for us to access that quite yet. Again, I don't want to take and allow his knight to get active. So, okay, this bishop's a bit of a problem. It would have been a lot easier if our bishop was on f4, to be honest, because then e5 would be far less easy to play. But we've committed to it, so play the position. We can castle. We're not under any threat if we castle, so I think I am going to castle. I'm not sure how I want to develop my queenside pieces. Okay, that I am happy to see, because now I'm going to drop back. f3 is on the cards to blast open the f-file, and c4 is on the cards to try and undermine the d5 and e4 pawns because remember if we can put pressure on d5 then that was going to weaken e4 because that's how that pawn is being defended c4 we do have to consider the move knight to a5 but i think we can probably just give a check 
And if queen d7, we could take, maybe? King takes, takes, take. Uh, I don't love it. Don't love it. But c4 is obviously the principled move. Knight a5. Check. Queen d7. Knight c3 takes, 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 takes. We just go down a pawn. Yeah, knight a5 is annoying. We could start with bishop d2, maybe. So that when we push c4, we'll control that square. He could play it already, but I don't think it's quite as effective if our pawn isn't already on c4. Okay, bishop d6, obviously a principled move, going to a good diagonal. But now I think c4 is a good move. If he takes... Uh, we could take with the bishop. We could also take with the queen. Because my bishop's going to have to drop back anyway, most likely. Okay, this is a free pawn. He's probably going to play knight e7, and it will be very difficult to actually continue defending the pawn. But takes here, knight c3. Ah, he does have tricks with um, trading everything and then going bishop to h2 check to pick my queen up. So you have to be wary of those kinds of ideas. I think we should still take, though. This is actually kind of looking like a French defense from uh, our side, which, I mean, that happens with Dakar Khan a lot of the time anyway. I'm not worried about him having attacks on my king. Oh, that can't be the right move. You have to go knight e7, surely. If you're going to go to d7, then you're not you're not helping to attack this pawn. Knight c3 looks logical. Pressure e3, pressure d5. And um, yeah, we have plenty of defense on the d5 pawn now. We can play moves like rook c1. We can maybe even go for f3 at an opportune moment. To go for something like takes takes. And then push like e4, e5. If we could do all of those things, eh, rook c1 might not even be that big a deal, to be honest. It might be better to go for f3 early, takes takes and d4, because our bishop and our knight will be supporting the e4 square. And this big clawn, I was about to say clawn, like, cluster, <laughs> it's supposed to be pawn cluster, in the center of the board, should be really, really dangerous. Wow, g5, going for g4. That doesn't do anything, I don't think. I'm going to push f3. If anything, that just weakens his knight, I think. Yeah, let's take that with the bishop. We still control g4, so he can't even push it anyway. It's 2v1. If he pushes it, I would take with the pawn rather than the bishop. Just because my bishop dominates his knight right now, and my bishop's a great piece because I'm going to kick his knight out with e4, e5 anyway. And black is under some serious pressure. He only has two pieces developed. He's down a pawn. We have so much central space. We're going to push e4 to go e5. His king is weak. His knight struggles to develop. His rooks can't do a whole lot. His queen isn't going anywhere and he's voluntarily pushed pawns in front of his own king. Bishop g3 looks like a nice move, but I think we just keep pushing. And we've got ideas like d6 coming as well. This is falling apart for black. We also have knight e4 if we want it, to attack the bishop. And look at some of these weak dark squares. If he goes knight to d7, we could push d6, c6 to block the diagonal of the bishop towards the rook, because we are threatening this. D6, C6. Knight uh, E4. We don't even have to go D6 yet, to be honest. I feel like we can wait, because he can't even push C6 to block it. So why, why rush? Often the threat is uh, better than the execution, right? And that is particularly the case in chess a lot of the time. So let's go knight e4. Let's just target a bunch of stuff. 
Uh, where's the bishop going? I don't know. H4, it gets trapped by g3. Don't be scared about moving pawns in front of your king if there is a good reason for it. And your opponent has no counterplay. Bishop f4 is probably more likely. I will probably snap the bishop off the board. And probably play a move like bishop to g4 to open my rook up. Just put pressure on the knight. Maybe bishop f5 is an idea. He also can't develop this knight because the only development square has been taken up now. And this knight also can't go anywhere. Like it literally can't go anywhere. All of its squares are taken. So two of his pieces are completely out of the game. If these knights are out of the game, then this rook is out of the game. This queen can only go to e7 or h4. And neither of those squares do a whole lot. So this is looking good. Queen d3 is also a move get on this diagonal and threaten moves like knight to f6 followed by mate obviously he'll probably meet that with a move like king h8 or king g7 to get out of the way but then uh, I feel like that's a one move threat we are closer to the king side but it's not substantial I think I prefer bishop g4 just opening up my rook also, if the queen comes to h4, she won't be defending the pawn anymore. Um, I don't know how he defends this. And now my queen can swing over to a square like f3, potentially. Or after my rook takes, maybe e3 to target h6. Okay, if we could take this and he had to take with the queen, then this would be a glorious fork. But obviously, he does not have to take with the queen. He can take with the knight, unfortunately. I don't even have to take this with with the rook. I can just go queen f3 and take with the queen because he can't defend it. But also potentially on this diagonal, I know d5 is not defended anymore. But like I said, this knight can't really move. Uh, so the queen can't attack the pawn. And if the knight does move, then we will have knight to f6 anyway, picking up the rook. So he really shouldn't be doing that. And if my knight moves, then my queen will be defending d5. But realistically, the d5 pawn is kind of irrelevant at this point. Because I've basically just been trying to shift my pieces over to the king side. Like if you look from this move, I'm trying to bring my knight over, my bishop over, my queen over. Uh, just to um, Because we have pressure on the queen side, but we've accomplished our goal of winning a pawn. By going for the plan of c4 and c takes d5. We've locked out a lot of his pieces on the queen side. And now we've shifted our attention over the past few moves to the king side. To bring our pieces over. We can always play a move like rook c1 if we really want to try and strangle him. On that side of the board as well. But I think we'll probably have checkmate in like, I don't know, five or so moves. Or a significant amount of material one. Yeah, so this looks like the move. I mean, he's not even threatening to take this. Anyway, because he'll get forked. So we don't even have to. We could just take here. Rook g7. Ah, let's just cash in. Let's just get the rook. Can we do better? Can we? Something like bishop f5, queen g4. I could take on f4. His rook can only go to h8 to save itself. I don't think that really addresses any of the issues in his position. Am I looking for too much? I actually don't think so. Because we do have these kinds of checks on h5 to unleash attacks on f7 as well. h6 is weak, f7 is weak. Obviously his rook's still hanging. Yeah, it might be more accurate to take on f4 with the queen than just to take the rook. Because the rook's not really going anywhere. If, um, 
Let's see Rook H8. Knight here check. Isn't he just getting mated? Because we're going to get to F7. I don't think it matters where he moves. I think Queen F7 is mate regardless. Well, King G6, Queen F7, King G5 is not mate immediately, but certainly coming. Something like mm, Rook G5, King H4, G3. That would be a nice mate. I think that's probably a forcing line. I don't see how he uh, deviates from that. And my opponent resigns, so... Okay, just to show. Oh, if he goes here, we just have Queen F5. <laughs> we don't even have to take on F7. What am I on about? But we could also have done this line, I think. Uh, like so. So that would have worked. And, yeah, if he moves to H7, this is mate. And if he moves to G8, then this is mate. Cool, let's see what the computer has to say. Um, I don't think we played that perfectly, especially the opening. Um, I probably should have gone for more of a London position. Please let me know, in a lot of these Cairo games, I think a lot of the time they're going to call for a London-esque position. So if I was playing this properly, I'd probably go Bishop F4, something like Knight F6, E3, Bishop D3, Knight BD2. But that's literally just a London. And I feel... I don't know, I feel grubby playing a London. But if you guys if you guys are down for it, then please let me know. But yeah, let's get into the analysis. Let's see what the computer has to say. Okay, so... The computer gives me 92.4% accuracy. And my opponent 766 We only had one inaccuracy the whole game, apparently with uh, no other mistakes at all. So let's see. C3, D5, and obviously if my opponent goes E5, we kind of get a Karo Khan, except we're a move ahead. And that is interesting. We'll, I mean, we'll certainly get this at some point, so we'll see uh, what happens there. But we have D5, D4, Knight C6. Like I say, Knight C6, maybe it's playable. But it just looks strange. Your knight f3, h6. c4 is apparently the best move, but we're playing this like a caro. So bishop f4 I did consider. And I wanted to mention this g5 idea, which I thought justified the move h6. If you push g4, I don't know, I wasn't exactly thrilled with this. But then I suppose... The only real way to save the rook without causing yourself significant harm, because if you go knight f6, this is just a bad pin. I can just continue developing, and I'm just better. And if you go rook h7, then I have queen d3, or e3, bishop d3, to attack the rook. So the only real good way to defend this is to go f6, apparently. And... Yeah, that is not does not look nice. It really doesn't, because this diagonal is so weak. So, believe it or not, e3 the computer actually really likes. Um, bishop to g4, we go bishop to e2. Maybe a bit passive, maybe I can go bishop b5, but yeah, I probably should have, to be honest. Knight f6, we go h3. To just ask my opponent the question... Of course, he can just retreat to a square like f5 or h5. And the game continues. Probably we should be going bishop b5. c4 is on the cards. Of course, we can castle. Knight bd2 is never going to be a bad move. But I think the computer likes the idea of c4, knight c3, which is similar to what we did in the game. Knight f6, h3, takes, takes, e5, which is obviously the best move. Now, you don't want to take this, really. Because then this knight is just very, very good. And this pawn is going to come to c6 to support his centre. And black has an incredibly comfortable position. So I instead go queen b3. You could also castle. Uh, because my point is, if you push e4, I'm coming back and c4 is happening. And that's basically what happened in the game, right? And my queen is already putting pressure on your position. 
My opponent goes b6 though, and it looks like a good move because it stops me from taking on b7, but firstly it weakens this diagonal, and secondly it doesn't really develop anything. Like, the computer likes rook b8, which you might not love if you're looking at this position, but it kind of just solves all your problems, you know? You just defend the pawn and you don't create any weaknesses. B6 though, okay, we can't take advantage of anything immediately. I castle, we have E4, drop the bishop back, A6, and A6, I suppose he's trying to stop this. But bringing the knight to A5 was better, and then you can play a move like um, C6. And I mentioned this a few times in the game, Queen A4, Queen D7, I didn't really want to trade queens. And king takes is better than knight takes, which I referenced in the game, because the knight's doing a good job here, and with the queens off the board and the position quite closed, the king is pretty safe. I don't know, I wasn't in love with this position. The best plan is apparently b3, let's say something like bishop to d6, and then going for c4 with extra support. So I think the ball is always in white's court, but I didn't want to trade queens unnecessarily. So a6, I go bishop d2. c4 is the best move, but I didn't love knight a5. Again, the computer wants this line. And I checked this in the game, but after knight takes... Apparently I need to go f3. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. Because if you take, then um, I feel like you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Because my pieces are going to come alive very quickly. And... If you don't take and push f5, then my rook just comes alive. And knight c 3 is on the way to boot this knight out. Bishop d2 maybe to threaten to ruin the pawn structure. It's a nice position, but I go bishop d2 to try and stop this idea before it even happens. Now I knew he could still do it, but I thought it was less effective with c4 already on the board. Again, I can go for this queen a4 line. But I could also just drop back to c2, which is probably what I would have done. And then I can maybe play moves like b3, c4 to build up this idea. Anyhow, that was basically my only inaccuracy of the game, I believe, bishop d2. But bishop d6 is played. We go c4 now. And now if he goes knight a5, we just chop it off, right? Castle, c takes. And my opponent has to do this. I mean, he could also take, though. And I can't take back because of bishop to h2 check picking up the queen. Which would not be good. Although, <laughs> it is actually kind of playable with the white pieces. Two minor pieces for a queen, I guess, because of our bishop pair and our solid pawn structure. But obviously, we're not going to allow that. If knight takes on d5, we can just play moves like knight c3. And again... His queen side is a little bit flimsy, e4 is a bit flimsy. We just have a nice position, a very solid pawn structure, and this is what the Cairo Khan is all about, really. So, knight b8, though, is just weird. Knight c3, g5, I don't understand at all. Like, g4 isn't even a threat. Like, we control that square, I don't understand what that was. So, f3, we trade, and that, this is the best idea. And you'll find this in a lot of French and Cairo positions. Sometimes you just need to play f3 or f6 if you're playing with the black pieces to challenge this e4 pawn, or with black it would be the e5 pawn, and open the position up when it's favourable for you, which is what we do. King h7, e4, bishop g3. Okay, knight e2 is better. Just going after the bishop immediately. If bishop d6, oh, then we have e5. And if bishop to h3, we have... Sorry, bishop h4, we have g3. Okay, well, we could have won a piece. I didn't notice this idea. I think I was a bit too gung-ho. But, okay, it's still winning. Knight fd7. d6 is, of course, playable. But I didn't love c6. I thought it kind of blocked my position a bit. And, of course, it's still winning. But I thought I could just hold it in my back pocket. So I go knight e4, attack the bishop, trade bishop g4. Okay, c1 was the best move, apparently. I guess it just never allows c6. And I did mention that in the game, but I didn't feel like it was necessary. Uh, f5 was on the cards, but... Apparently this is the best move? If you take the bishop, 
I just double up. I'm never going to play this in a million years. And if you take the knight, again, I double up. I guess it's because his pieces aren't participating in the game. But I would not be giving up a piece for no reason. I would be taking en passant. And after knight takes, then maybe I can do this. And if we trade like this, then I'm just up two pawns. And I still have a big attack going. Even though my pawn structure, you know, these are my two extra pawns. They're nothing special. But this king is so open. This is game over. Bishop e6 is going to be a killer at some point. Anyway, he goes rook g8. f5 was probably the only try. Queen f3. You could have taken the pawn with the rook, but I thought, why rush it? Knight f8. Knight f6 check. And yeah, so of course you can take this rook. Queen takes f4 is marginally better though, and it's game over. Rook h8 though just gives me mate in 2 after knight h5 as I explained. But it's the most natural move <clears throat> to save the rook. The best move is knight h7, and then I can cash in and take the rook. I don't have to, but I could cash in and take the rook. And I mean, you still just have way too many problems in a position. Rook ac1, like... This is so game over. And again, this knight still can't develop. So he was just playing without a knight and a rook the whole game, really. Um, yeah, very smooth game. Very smooth sailing. Let's get into the second one. All right, game two. We have the white pa paces. The white pieces again. Obviously, we're starting with c3d4. And my opponent aborts the game. He was scared off by c3. See if this guy wants to face it. Okay, we've got another c3, d5, d4 position. But here we have e6 instead of knight to c6. So we're just going to develop normally. Knight, f, knight f3 again, we want to dominate the dark squares. h6 again. It's really odd. Really is odd. Um, okay. Do I go bishop f4? Do I get a London? Hmm. I'm going to do it. It just looks too natural. It looks too natural. Let's go e3. And we just want to dominate the dark squares. Um, again, yeah, I know it's a London system. And please don't hate me. But I feel like it is probably the most principled way to approach this position, unfortunately. <laughs> um, normally when you play from the black side, white doesn't allow you because it's e4 and c3 so the e4 pawn would control the f5 square unless it gets traded off and then it's not a london but here because white gets the first move yeah it kind of allows it because it's a d pawn game rather than an e pawn game but we might get c3 e5 d4 at some point in this speed run okay bishop e7 let's go with bishop to d3 there's no point putting the bishop on e2 because bishop to g4 isn't playable because the e6 pawn is in the way. And the e6 pawn is not advancing anytime soon. My opponent taking a bit of a Queen's Indian approach, which is interesting, with the bishops on e7 and b7. c5 has to be the idea at some point. We could go a4. Just to threaten the move a5. Ooh, knight c6 though. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that's good. I think he should be trying to play c5, not put a knight in the way. Now, I know this stops a5 because he will take it. But I think we can play for e4 now, potentially. Or maybe even c4. We'll see. There's no rush. Okay, he goes after our bishop. We could let him take and get a stupid strong grip over the e5 square. We could drop back and exchange. We could even venture in with the bishop and get this trade. But I feel like him trading off his knight, kind of like in the last game, only benefits him. Because he wants to move this knight so that he can push c5. Hmm. Bishop b5, maybe. If he takes takes and knight e5 putting pressure on he could also just go rook e1 and if takes takes again we have like a ridiculous amount of pieces aiming at the e5 square 
Let's do it. I think we'll be creating a Pillsbury Knight, I believe is the name for it. So we're going to whack this knight there, probably bring this knight to f3. f6 probably won't be viable because of knight to g6, which is one of the downsides of playing h6. It doesn't defend uh, the g6 square anymore. Let's throw the knight in. If he takes... I think we just take back with the f-pawn. And this is dangerous for black, it really is. Mm. I don't think that's any good. We can't go f4 like I would want to. But let's just go knight f3. Let's not even let him trade the bishop. I don't even want to let him do it. We have an incredibly strong pawn chain from b2 to e5. a5 is on the cards to try and put pressure on him. If he takes, he'll ruin his pawns. And if he allows us to go to a6, then we'll be squeezing his position even further. Okay, bishop to c6. I don't know what that does. I really don't. I don't want to take this and allow the queen in. We could just go bishop c2, queen d3. And try and induce a move like g6. I actually think that's a viable strategy, to be honest. This bishop defends a4, which might mean that our rook can swing over to the king side at some point. g3, h4 also isn't a terrible idea. Just to boot the bishop out. It's not obvious how we break through this position necessarily, but there is no doubting that we have insane pressure. g6, h4 would also weaken the h6 pawn. And then we can maybe lift our rook? Let's throw a5 in, just to stop him from doing it. If he takes, then we could even turn our attention to the queen side a bit. And maybe go b4 to stop any of these ideas in the future. Like, we literally could take, take, b4, rook e to a1, and completely shift our focus. Okay, b5, I think b4. Just to stop him from going c5. And we kind of clamp down on the queen side. Nothing is happening on the queen side now. Unless we instigate by somehow maneuvering our knight to a square like c5. That's not good. That's not good. Now we could just take on g6 and go up a pawn. Honestly, I think that's the best course of action. Just go up a pawn. We have pressure on the e file. Our knight is great. We could even just take his bishop. Yeah, let's just go up a pawn. <clears throat> our bishop can drop back to, to d3. Our position's beautiful. His bishop is terrible. Let's drop back, put pressure on. We will probably take this bishop if we can. Should we? If we go h4, he can only go to f4. g3, bishop d6. We could just go knight e5. Or rook e2 to take away the d2 square if we move our knight, because our knight's currently defending that square. As long as we don't allow him to push e5, which we're not doing, we should be good. I don't want to go g3 because that hangs a knight, obviously. And knight in immediately. I mean, he can't do this, but let's start with rookie two, because we probably want to double on the e file anyway, because that's where our pressure is. Obviously, we have a weak c pawn, but he can't access it because the c file is closed. So he can't get a rook there unless he like sacks his pawn and then puts a rook on c6. But that's not a viable strategy. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's kind of just suffocating here. And we're up a pawn as it is. I think if we can reposition our knight, play a move like g3, we're going to be good. Okay, so we attack this bishop. Bishop e8 is what I expect. g3. 
This bishop really can't move. Yeah, let's push. I've got to be careful that I don't somehow trade my knight for his light squared bishop and get an opposite coloured bishop endgame. I think I'm going to preserve the knight for now. I can always hop back to e5 if I want. Okay, he just hung a pawn. <clears throat> so we're going to take it. I was expecting bishop to d7 or f7 to defend the pawn, obviously. But uh, yeah, now we're just up two pawns. And this should be game over fairly soon. Let's drop back to e3. Now you might be worried about some kind of pin. But um, this bishop is going nowhere. With all our pawns on dark squares, this is very intentional. Because uh, I have a light squared bishop. So my bishop is amazing. Uh, because it works in tandem with the dark squared pawns. The pawns control the dark squares. My bishop controls the light squares. And I have a knight. And the knight can move anywhere. And I would like to go knight e5. But I think I'm going to start with rook a to e1. And now let's move the knight into e5. If he takes, I want to take with the rook. Because if we take with the rook, then we make sure there's still only one open file, which is the e-file. And we control the e-file. So that's ideal. Rook e7 would trade off a pair of rooks, which is obviously what we want to do. Even if we do lose control of the e-file, say someone like king f6 takes takes, he can challenge us with rook e7. But we're up two pawns. And it's even worse than that... Because all his pawns are on light squares. And they're fixed on light squares. And we have light squared bishops on the board. So he can't target my pawns. But I can target his. If my bishop makes it to a square like c8. All his pawns. Well his a pawn will drop. And then my a pawn will get through. If my bishop ends up on a square like d7. Then his c pawn will drop. It's not good for him. It's not good. This is what we want to see. Let's attack his bishop. Not many squares. Yeah, c8 is not a nice square. <clears throat> um, kind of difficult to advance. Let's actually go rook to e8. Because I want to take like this and then put my rook on e7. Or do this. This works. Where's your bishop going? I suppose he's making this a little bit difficult for me, but I am also threatening rook to h8 to pick this pawn up. Okay, I'm not going to say no to another trade. Because then I'm going to do this, and then pick up c6, and then it's game over. I, I kind of expect him to resign here. No, he plays on. He can't even access the e-file. Okay, now we'll trade rooks, because we're up three pawns. And uh, yeah, this is should be a very easy cleanup. We don't even have to worry about this entire side of the board over here. We can just focus on my two pawns and my king versus his king. Because none of the other pawns in the game can move apart from my c pawn, which I'm obviously not going to move. I mean, technically it would be a strategy because we could create past pawns, but... We already have two, so we don't have to worry about that. And my opponent resigns. So, there we go. I regret to have played a London-esque position. But, <clears throat> if I'm trying to play the Karo Khan and my opponent doesn't go E5, we are inevitably going to get some London-y type positions, unfortunately. So, you know, have a go at me in the comments. Totally cool with that. I... I make fun of London players all the time, so it's only right that I accept the criticism myself. Let's get into the game analysis. Let's see what the engine has to say. All right, so I had 89% accuracy. My opponent with 80.7. So it was a pretty good game. Uh, let me actually just fix my layout real quick.
All right, that looks a bit better, doesn't it? You can see the eval bar. So C3, D5, D4, E6. It really becomes difficult. Oh my god, my bad. It becomes difficult not to play a London. Because Bishop F4 is the best move by a fair bit. G3 is a way to approach this position, but I don't like those setups. And Knight BD2 is playable, but you're just blocking in your bishop voluntarily. I suppose you could try and play a collie type system with e3, bishop d3, knight b to d2, and d4. But I also don't know those positions well enough either. So I thought this would best resemble a caro, e3. And black really should be playing the c5. And this is why I was saying during the game that knight c6 was not the way to go. Because... Yes, the way to attack a London is the, is um, c5, really. That is the best way to go about it. Because if white takes, he loses his grip of the centre. And if white doesn't take, then you just have pressure. And you can maybe even push c4 and try and barrel down on the queen side at some point, right? But uh, bishop e7, bishop d3, we just play normal moves. b6 is a bit weird, but okay. Um, I maybe should have played h3 at some point to drop my bishop back to h2, which is a typical London idea. But um, yeah, I kind of just allowed this knight h5 idea. I was going to skip ahead, but he did actually take quite a while to play it, so let's not go too far ahead. Um, yeah, a4 is a good move, because... We, we, we might play a5 at some point, which we did in the game, and it closed the queen side down really well. Knight c6, <clears throat> of course, it stops this, but then it also stops c5, and it meant that it made it very difficult for him to attack my center. So knight bd2, we could maybe push e4 or c4, but my opponent changed the game a bit when he went knight to h5, because it meant that I, w I had to think, Okay, my bishop is going to die. All right, how can I make the best of this? Rookie one, takes, takes, and we have so much control over e5 now. My opponent can't play a move like f6, not only because he hangs e6, but because of moves like bishop to g6, taking control of the diagonal. So, castle. <sighs> Sorry. I'm a tired boy. I work tirelessly to provide content for you lot. Um, just, yeah, really take stuff it out of me. Like, joke, jokes aside, I just do a lot of other things. Um, obviously, I go to, go to the gym every day. At least I hope it's obvious. <laughs> so I think I'm just tired from my workout. But, uh, yeah, we have Castles, 95, which in hindsight might not have been the best because we did allow him to trade his knight off. Oh my god, I can't draw arrows. We did allow him to trade his knight off. Computer likes rook e3. Let's say a5. Queen e2. Let's say rook c8. Uh, it just wants me to barrel down on the e-file and then maybe play knight e5? I'm just curious. Bishop d6. Yeah, then it wants knight e5. So it wants me to really set up my pressure first. And then I suppose if black were to take and we get a position like this... Then I can start swinging the cavalry over to the king side. So we kind of get what we get in the game, except I'm more ready for a king side attack. Going knight e5 first, though, I don't have all of this set up. That's interesting. And it allows black to try and play on the king side a bit because of the move order that I played. Rook f1 is actually the best move, trying to go for f4, which I did consider, but I thought he was just going to take. And I don't know, play a move like queen h4. Computer says not to worry, just still go for the same plan. But I kind of just didn't want to allow it. Knight f3 and I was like, look, you're not trading your bishop off. Like, your bishop has nowhere to go. Taking is good, followed by rook e3. Yeah, that is quite nice, actually. And then we do have ideas like f4, f5, if we want. Queen g4, rook f1, a5, potentially. But okay, I decide to play a little bit slower, because 
the fact that the board is so closed means that I have the luxury of time. And f6 isn't really a viable move because you're going to trap your bishop. So if you want to go f6, you need to go bishop e7 and admit this whole maneuver was a bad idea. Which was part of the point of me playing knight f3 to say like, look, your, your, your bishop's misplaced. And then let's say something like queen d3, then g6, and then f6 really becomes unplayable. And my opponent lashes out in the game with uh, f5 as it happens g6 here i can take on g5 queen takes g5 and then go for this rook e3 rook g3 idea okay but i liked a5 the computer didn't like it <sighs> because of c5 i guess i don't have to react though can i not just push a6 c4 queen e2 uh, i guess it's not great but uh, that's interesting so it's better to take like this a takes rook takes queen takes and then maybe i take the bishop and ruin his structure I'll go for a move like queen g3 apparently queen d2 is better but same idea and if queen d8 defending Pieces are coming off the board though. Maybe rook e3. Queen e7. Rook g3. Rook a8, h3. I mean, white is certainly in the driver's seat, no doubt. And white is going up at least a pawn. But this is with some very nice defense by black. Black goes b5 though, and this allows b4, which is the best move. Because you don't really want to let black play moves like c5 or b5. So I just shot everything down, right? And now we can play where we're strongest, which is the king side, right? He plays f5, which makes sense, but you snap that off, expose some weaknesses. Queen takes was surprising. I was expecting rook takes. But then I was going to snap the bishop off to ruin his pawn structure. Okay, rook e5 is very strong. I didn't see this, but like from a distance, but if it were played in the game, I probably would see it. And the problem is that the e-pawn can never advance, which means this bishop is terrible. This is a lot of pressure. My other rook's probably going to come to e1 and maybe lift up to h3. This is horrendous for black. He takes with the queen, which is the best move, but it allows me to simplify the position like this. And it makes it very difficult for black to get out. I could take the bishop. And again, go for this. Oh, I could just go rook e5. He can't defend because uh, rook g6 isn't playable. Because my bishop defends that square. So g4, rook g5, I just win the pawn. Uh, I should have seen that. Although there are some tricks like this. Ah, I just have rook takes d5 though. So there's nothing really. <clears throat> so rook e2 isn't great. But it's... I mean, the position's still very, very easy for white. And I liked the idea of putting all the pawns on dark squares to really lock the bishop out of the game. <clears throat> and kind of pose the question to black, like, do you want to trade your bishop off for my knight? Because if it comes to two rooks and a bishop versus two rooks and a bishop of the same colour, this really is game over. But I've dropped back because I feel like I can like improve my position a bit more first obviously he gives me a pawn which he doesn't have to do bishop f7 makes more sense i wanted to play moves like rook a to e1 king g2 maybe h3 g4 king g3 just some improving moves and then put the knight back in and then go yo do you want to trade and probably force a trade because my position would have improved by the time that the exchanges happen because i could i dominate the position here and this was my plan. But, um, yeah, my opponent just gives me another pawn. Bishop d7. Rook d6 is better. But I didn't see any point in getting my rook potentially stuck if I misplay the position. So just bring it back. Dominate the e-file. Bishop g4. Then we put the knight in and go, yo, do you want to take? 
and he takes. And this makes the game very easy. He has no pressure. We just move up, secure our kingside pawns, make sure he has no play. If h5, then, I mean, it's not really very scary. And I just want to trade. Could I have taken here? Definitely. Probably would have been easier. Rook e8, bishop d7. I mean, yeah, then I would have just been winning this pawn and this would be incredibly easy <clears throat> to win but anyway I decide on doing this which is a bit inaccurate I suppose but it doesn't really matter bishop f5 was weird because he just lets me exchange win another pawn and then trade the rooks off and then it's obviously game over and my opponent knows it and he resigns because worst case scenario I can literally sack both of these pawns under Let's just say um, we have something like this. Uh, I can literally just walk my king over here and leave these pawns because I'm going to win everything here and then just push this forward. Obviously, I can just push these pawns forward to continue and win like that. But the point is there's so many ways to win that it is completely game over and my opponent knew it so he resigned and yeah another solid couple games in the caro i hope some of the ideas will be applicable in your own games and can improve your own playing of the caro khan i just took the game off of the video for some reason apologies thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next video